Hey guys, Mackie here with Ironside Ranch. Today we're going to go over some chainsaw basics. So there are about three big brands of chainsaws that everybody uses. There's going to be Steel, Husqvarna, or Echo. There's other brands out there. Those are the three that anybody uh, it seems like most experienced guys run. So it's your Ford Dodge Chevy uh, topic. For me, personally, I like stills. Um, I've had Husker Varnas. Um, I found that the Husker Varnas have issues where the stills never have and uh, that I've never personally had issues with. Um, the Echoes, I've got a good friend of mine getting ready to start up an excavation business and he's actually bought some Echoes. Uh, so we're going to do a side-by-side -side review because he bought the equivalent Echo to this. Um, and we're going to do a little bit side-by-side -side review of those. So I don't have a great opinion on the Echoes yet. Um, I know what I've researched online, uh, but I've never actually spent any time using one. So um, everybody that I know that does any significant amount of tree work uses this still. The logging crews, the, the, the arborist crews, um, they use stills, and so that's part of the reason why I stay with it. Um, the best mechanic I know in the world, he's out in Denver, is my cousin, and uh, he will only use stills. So this is what I use, and that's why I use it. I'm not knocking you for using an Echo or a Husqvarna, so take that for what it's worth, but uh, this is why I use stills and, and why I like them. Uh, <clears throat> personally, I have never had a problem with my stills. Um, I've never had to do anything other than air filters, um, air, air filters and spark plugs. Uh, and maybe the occasional carburetor adjustment or something like that, but uh, there's uh, uh, they, they just don't seem to have problems, and so that's why I like them, and uh, and that's why I run them. So the first thing that we'll talk about is we'll talk about safety, safety with your chainsaw. Now, <clears throat> the obvious things chainsaws are very very loud. You definitely need ear protection, uh, big headset ear protection, or even just the insert, however you want to do it. There's lots of science out about ear protection now, but you need ear protection. Um, it's it's a, it's a necessity. The other thing that I do with chainsaws is that you're going to want eye protection. These are going to throw a lot of chips, uh, a lot of little scraps of stuff, and uh, you want some good eye protection. You want eye protection that's going to come down and uh, cover the bottom part and get those cheeks real good down there and uh, make sure you get the sides because it'll, it'll fling chips left and right. And so uh, you're definitely going to want that, that uh, additional protection there. Now, there's, they do make the face shields uh, hard hat uh, with the Ear Pro all built in just for chainsawing. Um, I don't personally use one of those just because I don't like them. They're a little bit bulky, but they're a good option. Um, and they have a, the face shield as a full screen, so it's just a, it's a great option for protecting your face and protecting your ears. Um, and it has a hard hat. I don't use a hard hat when I'm chainsawing. A lot of people say you should. The reason I don't use them is because I don't have enough problem with things falling from above me to, to worry that much about it. Um, the reason that, that people wear them is for the, the idea of you know dropping logs and uh, and, and you know, if you're an arborist, you're dropping big limbs, stuff like that. You got stuff falling up above you. When you're working by yourself or with just a two-man crew, I don't find it to be that detrimental to not have it. Take that for what it's worth. If you want to get one, get one. They're they're certainly they're not stupid. I'm not saying that. Now, the next thing that you'll see a lot of people wear are shafts, and uh, the problem with shafts is that down here in the south. I'm much more likely to have a heat injury than I am to actually have a chainsaw injury. It's, it's just, just, just facts, guys. Those are statistics. Um, and so a lot of guys wear shafts. I get it. They're, they, it does protect your femoral, uh, your femoral artery uh, if you ever had a chain break or something along those lines. Uh, but for the practical intents and purposes down here, I have way too, we have way too much heat for us to be wearing shafts and putting all that extra clothing on. So I don't wear them. I wear nice thick, nice thick cotton pants. Um, that have stopped the chain before. Um, I've had one snap and, it, and the, the pants were strong enough to stop it. Um, so <clears throat> is, it, uh, is it ideal? No, but uh, it, it's certainly what I have to do down here. The, uh, the next thing, obviously, you're going to want a nice decent set of gloves. I use leather gloves. Costco makes great leather gloves. These are the goatskin gloves uh, from Costco. So, uh, but you definitely want a good pair of leather gloves. And I do wear steel-toed boots whenever I'm chainsawing uh, for extended periods of time. And the steel-toed boots are simply just to protect you against this hitting your foot on accident when um, you'd be using a toe to hold up a log or whatever it is. Um, there are safety Nazis out there with, when it comes to chainsawing. And those guys, what's great is that they'll probably never have an injury, but they, it's also very difficult to get a lot done. Uh, you know, safety, like anything, is a balance, right? We, we, we'd certainly put on our seatbelt when we get in our car, but we're not going to bubble wrap ourselves and put a helmet on. And, uh, so, th th so there's a balance there. 
And uh, the balance that I have with a chainsaw is I wear eye and ear protection, I wear steel toe boots, long pants that are a little bit thicker material, and I wear gloves. That's the way that I do it. Y'all do it however you want. There's a lot of options out there for safety for chainsaws, uh, but that's personally what I All right, so now, like I said, this is a, we're doing a chainsaw one-on-one -on -one video, so we're gonna talk about base operation. So some of you guys that know a lot about chainsaws, this is obviously not gonna be for you. Okay, so the front of the saw, we have our blade and our chain, and uh, the, 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 the blade being this section here, and you can see ours currently is right side up. Uh, you can barely read the still there. Uh, currently right side up. Every chain change that we do, we flip it over, and we run it the opposite direction. And what that does is that allows, as we're pushing up on it and we're cutting, that allows us to, um, to, to actually wear the top and the bottom evenly. It uh, gets us about 50% more life out of a bar. Okay, so up here we have our chain lock, so that obviously locks it in place, can't move it now. So the uh, idea being that if I'm, my hand is up here and I'm holding this properly and it were to buck up at me, so it hits a knot or something like that and bucks up, it'll stop that chain in the track. It actually works pretty well. You'll see uh, as you guys start sawing, uh, this, you'll, this thing will, will, will come into play more times than you think it would. Um, they, they do buck, it's just part of life. and. Uh, they, they, especially these bigger ones, a little bit more powerful ones. Uh, this isn't a huge one, but uh, it certainly has a decent amount of power. Uh, the smaller limbing saws don't buck near as bad, uh, but the bigger chainsaw you go, the more and more important that is, more and more important it is to have proper grip and actually holding that arm up there. All right, so if we come over here from the side, you can see on this side we have our quarter turn for our gas. On this right here, this is our quarter turn valve to, uh, to, to fill up the, the chain oil. So for those of you that aren't familiar with chainsaws, chainsaws take two types of oil. You have your oil mix that goes in here for your gas tank, that's because it's a two cycle engine. Then you also have your uh, bar oil, this is the oil that goes over here. This is just to lubricate the chain on the bar and uh, to make sure that you're not burning up those bars. Now, <clears throat> there are approved oils for both. For my oil, for the oil that actually runs the engine, I buy the still. Um, synthetic oil and we mix it at the recommended ratios for still. Lots of people, you'll see on the forums, lots of people do some weird stuff with that. I recommend that you do it exactly how, how the manufacturer tells you to. Now the bar oil, this like I said, only it lubricates this. This is not an exact science, so this is not necessarily a calibrated thing the way that gears and engines are um, to where the, the viscosity of the oil makes a huge difference. You will find guys using everything in here and uh, what we found is a great use is that we actually use used motor oil. I grow through enough bar oil that I just use used motor oil, fill it up in there, and uh, that lubricates it well enough that I'm not burning through bars. I have not had a problem yet. Do whatever you like. Use the recommended oil if you want to, uh, but personally, this is what we do is we use used motor oil and uh, <clears throat> allow that to lubricate the bar. It's a great way to burn up used motor oil, and uh, <clears throat> it, uh, it's, it's inexpensive. Now, bar oil is not that expensive anyway, so yeah, not something to be to, to go super huge over. We just have enough used motor oil around the farm from changing the oil on the equipment uh, that it's a great way for us to use it up and recycle it. Now, if we look right here, these are our teeth. These are these allow us to grab on. So when we're cutting, the closer here that we can get, the better, the easier it's going to be to cut through it. And so what we want to do, we want to use these teeth to actually grab onto the to the uh, to the log and actually help us guide it through and, and it'll pull the saw blade through. We want to try to avoid cutting up on the front part of the saw or even on the top of the saw. We really want to try to ideally cut down here uh, right about where the device is and, uh, and using these teeth here to help pull, pull it down um, and create a, a little lever here on a fulcrum here at this point. So stills make theirs fairly easy to come apart. You can see here we've just got a quarter turn screw here. There's one, two, and then a third one back here, and then that allows us to pull this off. Inside here you can see all our different components. This is our choke control there. Uh, I'm point to it right there. That's our choke control there. And we have our air filter here, spark plug, um, and uh, you know our pull cord. This is the only thing that you really need to worry about here is your spark plugs and, um, and, and the air filter. Uh, here, the air filter we change out, and we try to change this out about once a year. This one's actually pretty dirty, needs to be changed out. And, uh, and then the spark plugs, uh, about once every two years. And it's, honestly, that's probably overkill, but that's the way that we do it anyway. So uh, take that for what it's worth. 
Up top you have your little compression valve here. This releases compression so that you can see it right there where my screwdriver is at. That releases the compression uh, so that you can have a little bit easier time pulling um, if, if the engine's warm. Personally, I find this thing worthless. Uh, we never use it, and uh, I sincerely doubt that you'll have to on any uh, reasonably sized saw like this. Uh, you're just going to find that it's not needed. The starting operation on this one is very easy. You have obviously your trigger here, our, our throttle, and then we have a safety there on top. So we hold it down, push that lever there, and then it's usually one or two pulls with that, and we've got it going. Now, that brings us to the next point on this, is allowing your saw to warm up. Okay, people do not, as a general rule, like to allow their saws to warm up. Uh, you just see that a lot. And what that does is that's going to force your cylinders to actually, you, you, uh, you're going to have the, the, the heat of them and the expansion of them is all going to be at different times because certain parts take a little bit longer to warm up in certain, than, than other parts. And so you want to allow your seals, everything to expand properly and get up to operating temperature. And you want to allow all your metals to be at, to be at their operating temperature because that's how the machine's actually engineered. And uh, when, it's, when it's cold, not everything's actually at the temperature that it was designed to be run at. And so your tolerances, even though it's only a few thousand, uh, thousands, it, uh, th those tolerances make a difference. That's what causes the engines to burn up, and that's what you'll see. If you go to any small engine shop, they'll tell you that the reason that their engines, that half these engines they have are burned up, is because people simply didn't allow the engine to warm up. So the way that we do it is uh, generally, I, uh, <clears throat> I get it started up as soon as I get out to where I'm cutting, and. Uh, I can go take care of my other tasks, give it you know two to five minutes or so to let it warm up, and uh, by that point in time, my, my engine should be nice and warm. The first couple of cuts I make, I don't go full throttle on it, just ease into it a little bit, uh, giving it about a half throttle or so, a half throttle, three quarter throttle. Um, I'm really not getting after it after until about 10 or 15 minutes in, uh, when I know that that engine is nice and warm. Now, when you purchase your chainsaw, you're going to get a tool that looks like this. This is your chainsaw key. So, to, uh, generally speaking, it's going to have a small uh, flathead screwdriver back here, so you can do kind of basic, basic maintenance, adjust the chain tension, uh, remove your, your screws to, uh, to access the, the actual engine compartment. <clears throat> um, and then the other one on here, the, the other side, uh, is going to be two um, sockets. And the first socket, this is actually to allow you to take off the mounting nuts here for the, for the bar. Now you can see inside here we have quite a bit of dirt again. We have been using this saw to death here lately. Uh, so it's, uh, it's been, used, been, been certainly taking the beating. Now, if we want to adjust this, we have in here, we have our screw to actually adjust the blade tension. And so we can take that screw there and we can tighten it righty tighty lefty loosey and, uh, and we can make that blade nice and tight. Let's get that on there. This is not the most, I'm sorry, I tried to film this. It's not the most convenient position to be at. Sorry guys, that was too hard to, to do that at that position and actually try to get it changed uh, without uh, getting this bar to keep coming loose. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold that down in there. We'll tighten our screw down so this is right, right here in between these two studs. It's going to be your screw. Your tensioning screw, and that's going to uh, to tighten up your chain. Now, as far as getting your chain tight, that's kind of an art, guys. You don't want it so tight because then it's not going to run. It put extra wear on your engine, um, and it tends to bog down a little bit more. As the engine gets warmed up, the bar and the chain are actually going to get uh, going to to heat up and expand a little bit, and so the chain is actually going to become looser. And then you get the, just the natural action of the screws themselves actually loosening a little bit as you're using it. So. We've got that pretty well where we want it, um, and uh, the, again, there's lots of rules of thumb on there on how to tighten the the, uh, the chain down. Usually, what I do is I take it about as tight as I can get it to where it'll still spin, but there's quite a bit of resistance, and then I'm going to back it off a quarter or a half a turn or so, um, and uh, and make sure all I want this to do is I want to make sure that my chain is moving freely, but uh, but that there's no slack in it. I'll show you this way. I don't want any slack as I pull down on the chain. I want that to be nice and stuck. This is a cold tighten. Now, if the chain's a little bit, if, if everything's a little bit warm, then I'm not going to tighten it quite that much. I'm going to leave it just a little bit loose. So this, by the time the engine warms up, this is going to be all good to go, and uh, and, and the chain's going to be real loose on there, um, and just glide real nice. Okay, so let's talk about the operation of it and actually using the saw. So we've got it started, we've got it warmed up, our chain is adjusted right, 
Now we have to actually be able to use this saw safely. And so what we're going to try to do is, again, we're going to try to use these teeth to get that chain as far forward on the, uh, on the log as possible. Uh, we want to avoid using the top of the chain or the front of the chain. We want to, we want to get it as, as, as far forward as possible. Now we do want to avoid having this to where the chain, if the chain were to break or to slip, would actually slap between our legs because obviously these things are very sharp and uh, and they're going to get you and they can could potentially cut you from moral artery. That's the uh, that's the big concern. And so uh, what we want to do is we want to make sure that uh, that we're we're trying to avoid cutting uh, with it down the middle of our body. We want to kind of stand off to the side as much as possible. We want our arm on top of this to uh, on top of the handle to allow that that chain lock to actually build a function should the saw kick back at us. Now the saw will run much, much easier if you have it sharp. And so we carry these still sharpening tools around. This goes out with us in our little job box here. Uh, you can see this is our chainsaw box. It's a nice bright yellow old DeWalt bag that I had. Uh, very easy to find when you set it down in the woods. If you use something that's camouflaged, you're going to have a hard time finding it as you move around in the woods. So use something that stands out or spray paint that's an orange, yellow, pink, whatever, whatever color you want. Now, what I do, the way that we sharpen it, we use one of these. I take about two or three strokes on each uh, on each one of the uh, on each one of the teeth, and uh, I do that about every tank of gas I do. Do my chains wear out faster? Yes, they do, but I put a lot less work into cutting, and so I, if I, it costs me an extra chain per year, the chains are cheap, and uh, well, not cheap, but they're cheap enough, or maybe 30 bucks or so. Um, not a huge deal for me to change out an extra chain a year if I wear it out just a touch faster, so I don't worry about wearing out my chain. The other thing is, is keeping the chain sharp tends to actually make the blades last longer, and uh, or the bars, I'm sorry, I keep calling it a blade, but the bar, uh, they tend to make the bars last a little bit longer, and so, for that, uh, that reason alone, you probably are negligible on cost, but it makes a lot of difference if you take this and do two or three passes on it each time you fill up your tank of gas um, and uh, just make sure you're, you're, <clears throat> you're not running a dull chain. As far as the gas goes, we mentioned here earlier making sure that you're mixing it properly uh, but the one thing that we don't do don't ever allow your, your you don't want your, your tank to run dry you don't want to ever allow it to run out that causes the engine to sputter there at the end and that little bit of sputter that spike in rpms is um, according to a lot of small engine guys one of the causes of, of excess wear on the cylinders and uh, some of the small engine guys can tell you they can they uh, they'll, they'll tell you that, that or they claim that they can tell if an engine's been run out of gas multiple times um, or consistently throughout its life uh, just by looking at the, at the uh, shape of the engine. Whether that's true or not, I'm not a good enough mechanic to know, uh, but it uh, does surprise me if it is true, but uh, we're not going to go there. But the point is, is that it does cause a little bit of excess wear, so we don't, and it's also harder to get started back up, so we don't allow it to run out of gas. We fill it up when it gets down to about a quarter of a tank left, um, and just as through experience, you'll know what that time is. You don't really need many tools for, for us. A uh, you know, good leatherman on your belt is obviously don't, never hurt. Uh, it could, does come with the key. I've drilled holes in mine so that I can attach this to my belt when I'm out uh, out in the woods because it's handy to have that on you. The only other thing that we do recommend is a plastic wedge. These wedges work really great for getting uh, a tree off the bar when you're dropping a tree or to, uh, to be able to provide a little bit of angling direction and stuff as you're splitting wood. And uh, so what you do is you drive these in there and then the saw actually can go in behind it. And unlike a, a metal one, if you have a metal wedge, metal wedge here. if you use a metal wedge, you got to be real careful with your saw around it because every time you hit that, it's going to either ruin your blade or uh, just completely dull it up. So we don't want to hit that. So these ones, you can kind of run into them. You can see that one's been chipped up quite a bit. Uh, just from the, the back and forth action in there. And uh, so these are very handy to have on. I recommend you keep about two of these on hand and a way to drive them in. A uh, good small hatchet actually works really well to hit them on the back side. Um, and I keep a hatchet in my bag here. Okay guys, I think that finishes us up with this Chainsaw 101. Um, there's more details out there. There's more. We could talk chainsaws all day long. Uh, but uh, bottom line is, is that a quality saw cared for properly and, uh, and if you use these techniques and, and everything on, on, on keeping it up and uh, keeping a good sharp saw, uh, you'll have a lot of years of enjoyment out of them. Um, you, you very easily with a professional model saw should get a decade or more. Uh, they just last a long time. Even doing a professional amount of work um, <clears throat> and using these saws every day, they just last a long time if you take good care of them. So thanks again for watching guys. I really appreciate it. Like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. 
and uh, please check us out. We've been getting a lot of more of uh, the, uh, the blog information up on the website, so uh, IronsideRanchLLC.com, and uh, we, uh, Man Lynn keeps a good blog up there. I've been writing some for it. Uh, we've got lots more videos coming out here soon, so really appreciate y'all watching. If you're in the Birmingham area and like some beef or some pork, please just let us know, and uh, we'll get y'all set up. Thanks. Thank you.